Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Shanghai Lectures. Welcome to the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. So uh, I would just like to remind you to uh, register. If you want to get credit, if you want to do the exercises, then please do register by Tuesday, 9th of October, so that we have time to compose the groups for the exercises on this. Uh, uh, please register on this website. I think we uh, have uh, Xi'an in China not participating because there are holidays. There's the Mid-Autumn Festival, which is a national uh, holiday. So this is a big uh, celebration in China. OK, well, we wish them all the best for their uh, national holiday. Now, what we typically, what I typically do, you know, I send around some questions beforehand to the various sites. So Naltan, I think, sent around this. So I will be specifically asking uh, answers from these sites. But please, as Naltan mentioned at the beginning, just speak up any time you want to make a comment or ask questions so that we can get so that we can get uh, a more interactivity into the video conference. So, this, uh, let, me, let me first, so I typically like to use, so someone hasn't switched off the microphone. Okay, thank you. So, we, hmm? Hmm. So, the, uh, you know, if you look at the media, there is a lot of coverage of robotics in the media. This was in uh, 20 minutes, which is, you know, kind of the uh, local tabloid in Switzerland, the largest uh, newspaper in Switzerland. And they talked about this robot, which was developed at ETH in Zurich for learning to write Chinese characters. So basically the way it works is actually very... It's very simple, so basically it uh, has a database. As you can see here, it has a database with the, with the Chinese characters. Then it draws a Chinese character, you know, by trying to copy this. And then there is a camera that is looking at, for example, here is the textbook. Then the camera is looking at this, and then it changes, there is, so there is a learning mode, so then basically it changes, I knows, ah, this has to be, you know, I have to apply more or go lower on this so that I, I get closer to what I have. And so by doing this several times, the robot actually improves its writing, and over time it really looks very nice. So we already have uh, robots that can learn uh, to write Chinese characters. Okay, now the topics of today is cognition as computation, the sort of the, the, the classical view of artificial intelligence. We will look at some of the problems of the classical view and then point out the alternative that will be the main topic of this, of this term. Okay, then we have two highlights. So I will be talking for about an hour, 45 minutes, something like that, and then we have two highlights. One is Professor Christopher Luke, from the University of Tasmania in Australia. And we have another highlight, which is uh, David Escaramuzza, who also works here at the University of Zurich, who will talk about vision-based navigation. OK, so let me start with a, a short uh, recap. So we will have a, a student presentation from Russia. But let's briefly look at what we talked about last time. We talked about, you know, try to define intelligence, and we realized that it's maybe not so easy, hard to agree on, are there necessary and sufficient conditions, you know, forget it. Uh, and then we asked the questions, are robots, ants, humans intelligent or not? And, you know, we looked at ants and we saw arguments in favor 
of calling and intelligence and the arguments against uh, calling and intelligent. And then we sort of agreed that the more productive question would be given a particular behavior of interest, irrespective of whether you want to call that intelligent or not, how does it come about? You know, what are the mechanisms underlying this behavior? And this is also important because we want to build intelligent systems. And then we looked at you know, how you can measure intelligence. And the obvious measure that everybody knows about is this IQ. I mean, there is a, a huge literature on IQ testing. We just do this very briefly here. And then we had some, we raised some issues. And one of the big issues in IQ testing is, well, is the IQ, uh, is the IQ uh, in the genes or is it acquired? It's a nature and nurture debate, famous nature and nurture debate. You know, can you learn it? Can you train it? Can you train it? Can you actually get better when you practice? Are there cultural differences? And then we also looked at this point. What about professional success? Why is it that some people with high IQ are successful in their professional lives and others are not? We talked about emotional intelligence. Then there is this big issue. How does that relate to brain processes? You know, are the brains of people with high IQ different from brains of people with lower IQ. And then, you know, there are various criticisms. I mean, intelligence is multifaceted, many things. How can you just characterize all that with one single number? There is also an interesting phenomenon called the Flynn effect. And that is that the IQ globally overall has been increasing over the years for quite some time. Now it seems that a certain plateau has been reached and we can of course speculate why this might be the case. You know, could be nutrition, could be exposure to electronic media. You know, there are lots of uh, speculations about this. Okay, now before we go on, I would like to uh, switch to Moscow, and they prepared a short presentation on IQ and professional success. And I think what I need to... Uh so I think I have to... Yeah, here. Okay. Okay. Oh, this one. Okay. Right. Hi, everybody. Can you hear us? Can you see us? Yes. Yes, perfectly well. You can start with your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, hi again. And uh, first, we'd like to introduce our university. Um, uh, we are Russian State University for the Humanities, and uh, we are located in Moscow, okay. Russia. And we are the leading university in the humanities uh, in Russia. So we are quite big. We've got all, over 30,000 students. And uh, we've got a big variety of uh, departments and institutions uh, here, from history, philology, psychology, to artificial intelligence and uh, endangered systems. Uh, we've been the participants of uh, the project uh, for the last two years, since 2010. And uh, this year, we've got students from Artificial Intelligence, Information Security Department, Psychology, Linguistics, Philosophy, and uh, International Relations. And um, here, uh, the lectures are held on the basis of uh, the Center for Cognitive Programs and Technologies, which uh, conducts uh, research in the field of uh, cognitive linguistics, psychology, and uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, what we do in artificial intelligence is... Uh, what you see in your slides, uh, robotics, ontologies, computational linguistics, and uh, machine learning. We are uh, implementing and uh, applying the JSM method of uh, knowledge discovery in databases that was created here by our professor, Victor Finn. 
and uh, um, I'm glad to introduce to you our Artificial Intelligence Robotics Center, which is quite new at our university, and uh, it is run by Vladimir Pavlovsky and uh, Tatiana Volkova. <coughs> yes, uh, my name is Tatiana, and this year I will be a robotics tutor in our group, uh, and uh, we have a new center, and uh, our university is very interested in robotics. So. This year we are waiting for now robot uh, to come. We've already bought him, so we hope we'll have an interesting uh, practical t uh, practical exercises with him. Yeah, so we can participate in the competition uh, with now robot. Okay, and uh, so you're welcome at, sir, at uh, our university. <coughs> And uh, we are ready with the presentation about IQ and uh, professional success. Shall we start? Please go ahead. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hello everybody, and uh, I will uh, make a short review of uh, correlation uh, between uh, IQ and professional success. Um, uh, what's problem is, uh, what does it mean professionally successful? Uh, what uh, causes success and uh, how to measure success? Uh, IQ uh, me measure we should use or EQ, emotional uh, intelligence. Uh, these are the big questions and therefore impose limitations. Uh, what does it mean professionally successful? Uh, be rational, uh, use social skill, analyze and uh, interpret, uh, make time-limited decisions, uh, adapt to changing environment, uh, provide uh, multiple uh, solutions to a problem, uh, gain experience uh, and uh, develop capabilities. Uh, there are internal attributes of a uh, person, but uh, what about uh, professional skill, uh, his communication competence? Uh, uh, to measure a correlation uh, of uh, IQ with success, uh, we should uh, measure IQ and success. Uh, but uh, how to measure success? Money, citations, uh, Facebook friends. Uh, in uh, the simplest case, uh, it is money. The relationship between uh, IQ and individual achievement is well known. Uh, mm, nowhere is it uh, better documented than in uh, the Bell Curve uh, by Richard uh, Harris and, and uh, Charles Murray. Uh, the chart at the right uh, is from uh, this book. Uh, it shows uh, a correlation between a person's annual income and uh, his years of education, uh, which is related to uh, his IQ. Uh, the spread of dots uh, show that uh, other factors uh, are more important for income. Uh, what are other factors? Uh, we see this in later. Uh, uh, what about IQ and economic successful? Uh, uh, mm. After Murray, uh, Lynn and uh, Van Hannon review the scientific literature and uh, conclude that uh, IQ is an important determinant uh, of uh, educational attainment, uh, earnings, uh, economic success, uh, etc. Uh, they find in the United States and B uh, Britain uh, that uh, the correlation between IQ and uh, earnings uh, for individuals is very close to the above chart. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, IQ is a number, but success and intelligence are not. Uh, there are many uh, critics uh, about uh, IQ measurement. Uh, you mm, can see mm, the words uh, of uh, Sean Etcher. Intelligence that does uh, predict some success, but uh, it doesn't predict even uh, the majority of it. Uh, you can take uh, individuals of uh, equal levels of the intelligence, and uh, you find there is dramatic variance in their success, success rates. Uh, um, similar uh, point of view uh, have uh, has uh, 
Stephen Gould, uh, evolutionary bio biologist. Uh, okay. Uh, IQ is not the whole story. Uh, there is, uh, there are other competence. Uh, Self-awareness, uh, regulation, social skill, em empathy, uh, motivation. Uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, things are named uh, of uh, emotional intelligence. Uh, uh, to understand rational problem, we must possess a cultural and uh, not always oh, rational yes, it's 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 But why we, we before we cannot push it? Now you can. Okay, go on, please. To understand rational problem, we must uh, possess a cultural and uh, not always rational biological background in the form of emotions. Uh, uh, Therefore, uh, emotional intelligence, uh, EA, EQ, uh, is the foundation of truly great IQ. EA increases IQ. Mm. Mm. Look at this picture. <laughs> uh, Angela Lee Douglas is an uh, assistant professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Angela studies non-IQ uh, competence uh, that uh, predict success b both academically and professionally. Uh, according to her latest research, both uh, IQ and uh, self-discipline are correlated with a great point of average, but uh, self-discipline is a much more important contribute. Therefore, motivation plays a critical role in uh, IQ test scores. Hmm. That's why uh, uh, some with a high IQ are successful and uh, others not. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your uh, presentation. If there are any questions, you know, just speak up and uh, post the questions. So if you want. Display to me, hmm? Okay. Keynote. Okay. Here we go. So thank you for the uh, presentation. We looked at, briefly looked at the Turing test last week, you know, because Alan Turing was tired of all these discussions, you know, people saying, ah, but that's intelligent, but it's not really intelligent. And he said, we should come up with an empirical test. We apply the test and then we can say intelligent, not intelligent. That, that was his idea. And he came up with this test that we looked at last time. There is a criticism of the Turing test by John Searle with his famous thought experiment on the Chinese room. Now we will have a student presentation next week from uh, Xi'an, Northwestern Polytechnic University. We had to postpone this because of the national holiday in China. Now let's look at the classical approach to artificial, in or to intelligence, which is cognition as computation. Now the birth, so to speak, of artificial intelligence was in fact a conference that took place more than half a century ago in 1956 uh, at uh, Dartmouth in the east of the United States in New England. And there were a number of, well, it was organized uh, by this uh, gentleman over here, John McCarthy. Oops. It was organized by, uh, oops. John McCarthy, and he invited a number of people who had been thinking about this idea of automating certain intelligence functions. One or two of the most famous ones were Herbert Simon and Alan Newell. Herbert Simon, who was awarded later on the Nobel Prize for uh, economics. 
Now, they had developed a program called, a computer program called the Logic Theorist. And it could solve problem, problems from, uh, make proofs from uh, propositional calculus. So it's the simplest, most simple form of logic. And they claimed, I mean, if you look at the program today, you think it's a pretty stupid recursive program that sort of every first year student of computer science can write. But at the time, you know, it was a big achievement. And actually, Newell and Simon claimed that for the first time, you know, modest as they are, they said, for the first time in the history of mankind, have we developed an intelligent machine, a machine that can think. So basically, the first thinking machine uh, in the history. Another seminal paper that was presented at this conference was by a uh, psychologist, uh, George Miller, with a f very famous paper called The Magical Number 7 Plus or Minus 2. Now, what he was interested in is short-term memory. You know, we can keep certain things in mind for a short period of time. And he was interested in the capacity of short-term memory. How much information can we keep in short-term memory? And, you know, how, how do you measure information content? I mean, what's the simplest? You know, for computer scientists, trivial. How do you measure information content? Huh? Yeah. Bits and bytes, right. So basically, he was interested in trying to figure out how many bits or bytes can we store in short-term memory. And then he found that this is not possible, that there are huge variations if you try to measure the information content. And then he came up with this notion of chunks. I mean, it's, it's sort of a, a vague notion, but I think it's very plausible. So he said, well, what we do actually is, you know, we don't store bits and bytes, but what we do store is chunks. So take a phone number. Let's say if you take a phone number in Germany, then what we do is we don't memorize all the digits individually, but we have, let's say, something like an, an uh, international access code, which is maybe zero, zero. So that will be the international access code. And then we have a country code, and most people know that Germany, at least here in Europe, people know that Germany is 49 and then, for example, the person is in Munich. We know that the area code is 89. And then maybe if, if it's a university, for example, University of Zurich would be 635. That's basically the university. And then you have the extension. So, and, you know, these things like 009, uh, 89, these, and 635, we already know. So basically, we can just store these chunks, and then we only need to memorize the extension. And that sort of facilitates memorizing. And so he proposed these chunks, and how many, should, then the question is, how many of these chunks? And then he said, well, it's maybe around seven. And then he says, plus or minus two, so it's not clear, you know, could be nine, but could be five, or could be ten, could be four, but it's definitely not a hundred. And it's definitely not two. It's more than two, it's not a hundred, so it's around seven plus or minus two. This is a very influential paper, very influential psychologist. And then the third major paper that was presented was by linguist Noam Chomsky uh, at MIT <clears throat> with his famous, probably the most quoted publication in linguistics called Syntactic Structures, which was like a computational approach to uh, uh, language. And he introduced his famous transformational grammars that I don't want to go into, but it was an extremely influential paper. It turned out later on that it's maybe somewhat misguided if you look at this as a model of human natural language that seems to be functioning very differently. Okay, so, but this is now generally considered the birth of uh, artificial intelligence. And in 2006, we celebrated the 50th anniversary 
of artificial intelligence on Monte Verita in Ticino, which is a conference center which is run by uh, ETH. Okay, now what is the idea? The idea is that intelligence can be captured as computation. So intelligence as a computer program, intelligence as an algorithm. And then we need to characterize what do we mean by computation. And the obvious thing is, of course, and every student of computer science knows that, it's the Turing machine. Now, what is a Turing machine? So a Turing machine consists of a read-write head, read-write head, and a tape. And on the tape, there are you know, fields. The tape is infinitely long, but only a finite number of the fields have some content. Now, how does that work? I mean, it's extremely simple. So I have an example of a Turing machine here. So the read-write head has a state. Here it can be one or two, so two states. And then there is input from the tape, which can be a blank, an A, a B, or a C. And then we have these rules. So if the read-write head, just take one. Let's take this one. So this means if the read-write head is in state one, it reads from the tape the character A. Then the first thing is what it writes on the tape. So it will write A on the tape. So same thing. L means whether the tape is moved left or right, or the, 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 the head moves to the left or to the right. And the third one is the next state of the head, which in this case is one. OK? I think it's very simple. And uh, so I have here an example. So we have the read-write head in state one. The initial position of the read-write head is here, so over the A, and this is the content, what you see here, the content of the tape. Okay, now, and you have this rule table, this rule table that describes the actions of the Turing machine. And there is a special character halt, that's when the computation is finished. The machine stops. Okay, now, I would like to ask, uh, uh, Budapest, are they connected? Okay. Uh, yes. What, okay. Could you briefly explain what this Turing machine is actually doing? What is the result of this Turing machine? Can I send it Who's going to do that, guys? So, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, so it goes to the first uh, empty data, then it swaps the data, data A with B's and B's with A. That's right. Yes, can you briefly explain how it works that it goes to the blank, that it finds the blank spot? What rules so need what, to be applied? So you can see the first uh, state, it writes the current data back always right. and, and goes there. So this one is first applied, right? Okay, and then? And then it's here, right? It reads C, writes back C and goes there. Exactly. And so on and so on until it is here, right? And yes. then? It reads a blank. Uh -huh. It reads A. Ah, it's on first, a. first it reads the blank, huh? Yeah, okay. So it changes state. Right, it changes to state two. So basically, and then in state two, it will move to the right. And then it swaps. So basically, if it's in state two, reads an A, it writes a B. So it swaps. B's for A's, as you said, B's for A's, and it swaps A's for B's and leaves the C's as they are. Okay, I think it's very simple, you know, very obvious how this works. Now, what's interesting about these Turing machines is there is something called the universal Turing machine. So that's basically a machine 
that can simulate any other Turing machine. So basically, it's the only machine that we ever need to consider. And, all the, and that, that's the nice thing about theoretical computer science. So basically, everything can be done by studying one single machine. Because this machine can simulate any other machine. So what holds for this machine will hold for all the other machines. OK? So that's why this concept of a Turing machine is extremely powerful. Now, I mentioned that the tape of the Turing machine has to have infinite length, even though only a finite number of fields are actually occupied. Now, there's a cartoon by Roger Penrose that demonstrates the difficulties of hand... Now, this is if you want to implement a Turing machine in the real world. How can you do that? And here is an artist's rendering of this idea of a machine that has to manipulate a potentially infinitely long uh, tape. And it sort, of, it sort of shows that maybe the physical manipulation of this tape might actually be more difficult than performing the computation itself. Uh, not to be taken too seriously here. OK, now the next point that goes along with this idea of cognition or intelligence as computation is this idea of functionalism and the physical symbol systems hypothesis. Now, functionalism, and please interrupt me you know, if you have any questions. Now, the idea of functionalism is that you have a symbol system, and the symbol system has to be physically realized, physically instantiated. Now, the point is here, and uh, by the way, function, the term functionalism is used very differently in different disciplines. The way we use it here is that you can instantiate an abstract abstract computational systems, system in many different ways. It can be biological. You know, then you would have things like spike trains. Uh, sp oh. Spike trains. Can be electronic, you know, with flip-flops. Or can be mechanical. Or, as Hilary Putnam, an American philosopher, that, you know, this concept of Functionalism goes back to Putnam. He, he said it could even be Swiss cheese, right? And of course, we're very happy here in Switzerland so that Turing machines or intelligent symbol-manipulating machines could potentially be implemented as Swiss cheese. Okay, now uh, about just something about representations, symbolic representations, computational models. I do this very quickly. Again, there is a vast literature about this, but I think this is sort of the essence, the gist uh, of uh, representation. So assuming that you have a situation in the real world, I mean, these are toy worlds that people used to play around with in artificial intelligence at the beginning. So you have a table, TA, you have a block A, you have a block B. And this is how you would represent this in your system. You have block A, block B, table TA, and you have on BA. So B is on A, and A is on the table. Right? And then you have this encode operation that basically encodes this real-world situation in my, into my symbol system. And this is then called a symbolic representation of the real world. And then you can apply an operation T in the real world, which transforms this situation into this one by just you know, putting the block here. Okay? And then in the representation, we encode this operation, and we have a move operator that operates on the symbolic representation here. We apply the move operation operator to the symbolic representation, and we get this representation. And then we have a decode operator. And then, hopefully, if we have a good representation, a good symbolic representation of the real world, then what we get here, by going th through this path, should correspond to what we get when we do this in the real world. Okay, that's the notion, very simple notion of representation, but I think that's really the essence of what we mean by a symbolic uh, representation. 
Now, this looks very innocuous, looks very simple, and, you know, what's the problem? Well, we do have a few problems, as we will see. There is, for example, here, it just says encode. Well, I have the real world. How do I get from the real world to the representation? As we will see, this is the famous symbol grounding problem, which is largely unsolved. Also, here we have another encode. I mean, this is the whole problem of perception of the real world, which is a huge problem, largely unsolved. And then we have the decode operation that translates the representation back into the real world. So you know, we pack a lot of stuff into these you know, little words, words in code and decode. Now, this approach to intelligence, you know, working with symbolic representations, functionalism is called GoFi. What does it stand for, GoFi? Anyone? Salford, maybe, GoFi. What does it stand for? Huh? Good, old, fashioned, artificial intelligence. So basically, then this goes back to John Hogland, a philosopher who thought a lot about what artificial intelligence or intelligence is all about. And so typically when we talk about GoFi, we talk about symbolic representations, symbol manipulation, and all that. Okay, now in this classical approach, what are the research areas? So I took this from a, a well-known book by Russell Norvig, Artificial Intelligence, Introduction to Artificial Intelligence, a Modern Approach. So it's abstract problem solving. You know, Tower of Hanoi, you might know. Or games, you know, chess, Go. It's about knowledge, representation, and reasoning. You know, how do I represent the real world and how do I think about the real world? How can I act logically? It's a lot about uncertainty as we will see the real world. One of the main characteristics of the real world is its high level of uncertainty. Learning and memory. And if you look at this, here it says communication, perception, and action. And this is the only part where they are dealing with the interaction with the real world. All the other stuff is basically internal or seemingly internal. And that's so this internal abstract reasoning is basically the area of classical artificial intelligence. Now, let's look at some of the successes and failures of this approach. The success is, if you use, I'm not going to ask who knows Google, but if you use Google, then you will be using, well, maybe without being aware of it, a lot of algorithms that have their origin in this kind of thinking, like algorith algorithms on machine learning, on heuristic search, pattern matching, and so on and so forth. Formal games, chess, extremely successful. You know, Today's chess programs win against everybody on the planet. Text processing systems, to some extent, machine translation. We will have a, I think next week, now done, is that right? Next week we'll have a presentation of machine translation. Yep. So next week we're going to have the world guru on machine translation in the video conference giving a talk, and he will demonstrate uh, machine translation, and this can be done now online. So hopefully we will be able to translate what I'm saying here uh, simultaneously into Spanish for those who would like to um, read the lecture in Spanish. Then data mining systems, I think, you know, with their machine learning algorithms, appliances, and I think manufacturing, a very big success of the classical approach. We will say more. Uh, very shortly. Now, I think what we can say is these are you know, clever algorithms. Whether you want to call that intelligent or not, we had the discussion last week. I mean, they just do a very good job in the application. So it's application-oriented. 
right? For example, chess, you know, we had 1997 when uh, IBM Steve Blue won against Gary Kasparov, the world champion at the time. It was a big sensation that it did not only win one game, but actually a whole tournament. Now, in terms of failures, I think this approach has not been able to deal with things that are, have to do more with natural forms of intelligence, like recognizing a face in a crowd. We do have face recognition programs, but you know, definitely not the way we can recognize faces, you know, with different orientations, sliding conditions, and so on. Perception, vision in the real world is a uh, big problem. Let's maybe have a look at this. Why is perception hard? And I would like to ask maybe uh, the people in Berlin, Verena, yes, are you there? Why is perception in the real world so hard? Hi, Rolf. Okay, hi, Verena. Okay, we can hear you. Perception is very hard. We will have a few answers. So, Markus? Okay. Yeah, the first thing. The first thing I want to mention is something you already mentioned with the part you said about the physical symbol systems. So it's really hard in a meter level to decide which is the object about, which is the meaning of the object. And of course to deal in first place with perhaps in general is the real world is really noisy and you have to filter and focus on, uh, on, on the topic you want to right. deal with. Right. I will skip the microphone to the other audience. Okay. Other ideas why perception is really hard? Yeah, I think one big problem is that um, um, small changes in the environment lead to big changes in the sensory input. So um, a little change in lightning condition can be a huge problem for object recognition algorithm. So what was... Uh, so is... Is the can, can you say that again? Is the or small you, changes in, um, in the situation or environment lead to big changes in the uh, sensory input? Okay, okay, big changes in sensory input. Yes, okay. Do we have other other points that maybe uh, m make this hard? Um, yeah, I think it was mentioned. Uh, is this working? Yeah, it's working. We hear you. Yeah, okay. yep. uh, but there's a lot to perceive in the world, and obviously a real, a concrete machine cannot perceive everything, so you have to decide what to perceive. Um, okay, okay. F let's, shall we call this focus of attention? Something yes. like that, right? Okay, and then what else? We have, if you think about visual perception, you know, orientation. You know, we can recognize a face from the front, but also from the side. We have, also when it gets darker, different lighting conditions. And then a big problem in visual perception is partial occlusions. you know, objects partially covered up. We can still recognize them, right? Now this is in, in vision, we will hear just a bit later, we will hear about vision in the real world from Professor Skaramutza and he will uh, introduce us uh, to the secret. So thank you very much, Berlin. And uh, now what I would like to do is point out some problems of the classical, fundamental problems of the classical approach. Some ideas have already been mentioned now by the people in Berlin. So I think in general, the problems are where we have to deal with the real world interaction. I think we can now build, you know, building software, we have very good methods, uh, we know how to do that. What's always a big problem is the interaction with the real world, and here it's important to understand that there are fundamental differences between the real world and the virtual world. 
I took here as a virtual uh, formal world, the world of chess here, world of chess and, uh, and the real world. So this is uh, Monica here on the, that you see on the left. She was a former master student in our laboratory and also a chess master. So, anything to do with the real world interaction? So uh, maybe we can uh, switch to a Seoul, to Korea, and you can give us some ideas on fundamental differences uh, between the real world and a virtual world, like uh, chess, for example. Yes? Um, yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. I think again, uh, the problem is uh, perception, yep. uh, the difference. Of course, the virtual world is trying to imitate the real world. But again, um, maybe the successful is not uh, up to that standard yet. Okay. Uh, take for example, an online virtual world uh, like Second Life. Um, uh, it tries uh, to make another life for us in the virtual world, and uh, it uh, of course the gap is the, the gap between the real world and the virtual world is getting narrow, maybe, but uh, still uh, problems in the ah. uh, perception. Right. So, so you're talking basically about this model relationship that we mentioned before. You know, how good a model yes. is the virtual world of the real world. Okay, I think that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting uh, point. Now, I would, was also interested in what are the characteristics of virtual worlds. If you take something maybe simpler than Second Life, if you take something like chess, and on the other hand, you take something real world like soccer, playing soccer. Okay, so ma ma we can also have uh, fr from. Uh, Any answers? Um, of course, the interaction is another problem. Right, uh, definitely. In virtual, the, the interaction. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I mean, that's uh, the interaction that's with the real world. Is, is a big problem now. What are maybe what are the characteristics of let's say a virtual world like chess? Let's take chess. Huh? So you have. I mean, how does chess work? So you have board positions, right? Board position and a board position is a board position or not. You know, there's nothing in between. So it's clearly defined. And if you have a particular board position, then what can you say about the possible moves? Maybe here in Zurich, what can you say about the possible moves? Yeah. There's a finite number of possible moves, and all a player can do is choose one of them from this finite set. Right. And then the next position is given again. And if none of the players makes a move, nothing happens. So there's basically no intrinsic dynamics uh, in the situation. If you think about soccer, you know, you don't have very clearly defined positions. You know, the players can be anywhere and they can basically do anything. You know, they can scream, they can jump, they can hit the ball. They can run, they can sit down, you know, they can do basically anything. There's no clear set of rules. Also, in, in chess, basically, you do one thing, you make a move. In the real world, we can do many things simultaneously. We can walk, we can talk, we can smoke at the same time. Um, and then an important point is, in the real world, I mean, you talked about the perception as being difficult, as being hard. Well, 
information acquisition from the real world, in that sense, always requires time, irrespective of how fast it is, because it's a physical process, it requires time. Always when you have a physical process, you have the notion of time. I just see that I have to uh, hurry up. Uh, the real world is largely unpredictable. So I don't know what's happening out there. You know, I don't know who is going to do what, in which way people move. It seems that we, as human beings, can easily cope with this high level of uncertainty. We don't even realize that we're dealing with that level of uncertainty. But if we're trying to build machines that can do the same thing, we immediately realize that we have you know, the, the difficulties of coping with this high level of uncertainty. I will, I will uh, give you the slides then afterwards, and uh, you, can, you can read about this. Now, here is just a comparison. So we have the successes on this side. I think it concerns mostly applications and the failures. It's more natural forms of intelligence than anything to do with the real world, and the real world is always rapidly changing, right? It's nonlinear. You know, think, think of the weather reports. It's a highly nonlinear system. That's why weather reports are never uh, uh, really good. It's, it's impossible to really fully predict nonlinear systems. So I think we're up against something fundamentally different when we deal with the real world. And intelligence, the intelligence that we look at, is uh, to deal with the real world. Now let's look, as, as an example, at industrial environments. The environment is well known. We know the components. We know the arrangement, the, geomet the geometry of the situation. There is little uncertainty. We have high predictability, and we can program everything down to the last detail. In a real world, we have limited knowledge, limited predictability. Everything is rapidly changing. We have a high level of uncertainty, which makes matters very difficult. Now, the principles, for example, in industrial robots, we have very strong, precise motors, fast motors. We tell a motor to go to a particular position. It will go there. You know, like these are ABB, this is an ABB robot, you know, Swiss precision. So it will go, it will go there. We have centralized control. I come back to these points uh, later on. Again, uh, we need a lot of computing power, but that doesn't matter because we have the computing power. We can use powerful optimization techniques. By contrast, if you look at the real world, we have to cope with uncertainty. Now, humans are very imprecise. You know, Everything is a bit wobbly on the human body. We're not precise compared to robots, so machines are much more precise than we are. We have low precision. We're compliant. That is, it means when we hit something, we yield elastically. We don't push harder, and we're very reactive. We can react to situations in the real world. And this also implies that the methods that work for virtual worlds can most likely not be simply transferred to the real world. And that's what the whole lecture is going to be about. What kinds of methods do we need in the real world in contrast to the uh, virtual world or the artificial world? We'll give a lot of examples next uh, in the next lecture. Now, just to finish up quickly, the fundamental problems of the GoFi approach of classical artificial intelligence. Because we have a symbol system, we have what's called the symbol grounding problem. So I think that was mentioned by uh, the people in Berlin and by the people in uh, Korea. It's the relation, it's perception, it's the relation to the real world. So the issue is, of course, if you have a symbol system and if, if in your uh, idea, intelligence is symbol, abstract symbol manipulation. You have to be able to, you have to have a way of attributing meaning to the symbols, you know, as, as the people in uh, Berlin mentioned. So you have a symbol like tree, you know, typically a node or something, and then you have to be able to make the connection between these node, this node and what it means in the real world. And here is a cartoon 
by Gary Larson. I will be showing a number of them. He has been thinking a lot about how to illustrate these problems. I think it's very nice. The real world does not come with labels. So I have to you know, see, and then if it's say, ah, well, this is, maybe this is a chair, maybe this is a computer. But the computer is not labeled as a computer, or the house is not labeled as a house. That's really the symbol grounding problem that we're up against. We'll have to say more about that. Then there is what's called the frame problem. There's a frame problem and frame of reference problem, but the frame problem is how do you keep a model of the real world in tune with the real world? If it is indeed the case that in the real world everything changes rapidly, then we also have to change, adapt the model continuously, right? And one of the problems is I have to have the information about the changes. And information acquisition in the real world takes time. So the more detailed the model is, the more information I have to acquire about the real world, the more time it takes and the more likely it is that my model will not be in tune with the real world, right? So, for example, take a GPS, you know, that contains also information about traffic jams. Well, that changes, you know, almost from one second or from one minute to the next, right? So you need to acquire this information. So that's the frame problem. How do you keep the model in tune with the real world? It's also about what's called side effects, and maybe I can... Uh, I can just briefly explain this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Side effects. If I walk out of the room here, you know, I, I walk over here. Now, my glasses are on my head or my nose. Now, I can say on glasses, nose, right? Now, I walk over here. I walk over here. Then my position changes. And at the same time, the position of my glasses changes. That's a side effect of my moving over here. But the position of the computer does not change. Your position does not change. The position of this television set does not change. So most things do not change in the real world. But some things do change. Now, which ones change and which ones don't change? If I only... I mean, for us, we have common sense. For us, it's obvious. For us, it's very obvious. But for a computer that just has this symbolic representation, that's the only thing it has to operate on. So unless this relation that my, when I move, the glasses that are on my nose also move, unless that is explicitly represented, I don't know. And then how do I know that the color of the room is not changing, right? So, but most things don't change. This is the frame problem. And uh, I would like to ask you to read this very f this fun example by Dan Dennett, uh, uh, one of my favorite uh, philosophers, uh, who has been thinking a lot about these issues. Okay, so we need an embodied approach, and uh, we we so basically looked at this. So there are problems with this, and what we do from now on is we look at this embodied approach, cognition as emergent from sensory motor and interaction processes. I think I will take another about three, four minutes just to finish up these topics and then uh, we will take a short break. Now, <clears throat> we looked at some of the failures of classical AI, you know, which have to do, for example, with uh, perception action in the real world. And we looked at some of the fundamental problems. I mean, there, there are more, there's a literature about that. Now, if we look at the uh, embodied approach, then we say, well, sensory motor and interaction processes. And before, we were talking about abstract problem solving, you know, playing chess, making mathematical proofs. Now, are we just doing something different? Well, there is a very tight connection, and that's basically what the whole class is about, this connection. There is a nice quote by a British biologist, Louis Wolpert. He asked the question, why do plants not have brains? I don't know whether you've asked yourself this question. And then he says, well, the answer is actually quite simple. They don't have to move. 
So in this view, the evolutionary selectionist pressure on the development of the brain, the nervous system, has come from the need to interact with the real world, to move in the real world, to survive in the real world. And what's interesting is the only way we have to interact with the real world is through our own body. It's the only way. And in this interaction, what we now call intelligence or thinking or cognition has evolved over millions and millions of years. So it's a gradual property. It's always a property of a complete organism that interacts with the real world. We don't have an algorithmic ether, you know, kind of a symbol crunching thing over here, but we have a complete biological uh, organism. And the brain or intelligence and the body have co-evolved. This interaction is always mediated by the, bo uh, by the, the body. I think, uh, let's say, because we are running out of time, I, I do this uh, very quickly. It's called the frame of reference problem. And just to illustrate it, Nathan, can you play the Hyder symbol tape? Now, this is a video or a movie. At the time, they didn't have video. Uh, from, I think, from the 1950s. Uh, can you stop, stop for a second? Stop, 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 stop. Uh, I want to say something first. Uh, so they made a video, which is just what you will see is just triangles and, and circles. And then just uh, observe what you see, and then I would like to switch to Abu Dhabi uh, for a short comment. Okay, now please play the video. Okay, okay. Can we briefly switch to Abu Dhabi? Is anyone there? Yes, okay. Yes, for, we're here. Okay, for a short comment. Yes. So basically, um, yeah, well, this experiment was conducted to see what observers uh, had to say about these, uh, to these facial interactions with these geometric uh, objects. And basically, the story was that the, the two small objects, the circle and the triangle, they, they were in love. And, and the big uh, triangle like was like harassing them. And you could understand basically the behavior of each object just by understanding the, mm -hmm. the spatial interactions between them. And you could also, you could also understand the, the emotions and that sort of stuff. Right. So basically, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's very much to the point, you know. So we're making a complete story out of that, even though what we actually see is just triangles and circles sort of moving over the screen, right? So we have a tendency to attribute intentions, you know, our own thoughts, ideas, and feelings into the environment. And we have to be aware of the fact that these are our attributions. It not, it's not the mechanisms inside the triangles and the circles, right? So it's in our heads, it's not in the heads of these uh, uh, objects. I'm skipping this, uh, you can look at them at the details in the slides that will be uploaded or have been uploaded. And there are various issues here. Now, this frame of reference problem is so important, it's very obvious. It's extremely obvious. 
but it's very important if you look at the literature, there is a lot of confusion about this problem. And because it's so important, I will mention it every single week during this lecture series, every week. Should I forget to mention it, the first person to sort of notice that I forgot to mention the frame of reference problem is entitled to either a bottle of champagne or a box of Swiss chocolate. Okay, I think uh, that's it for, the for today. Assignments for next week would be chapter three, reading chapter three of the book and familiar familiarize yourself with the, you know, the main brain imaging technology which are papers that, you know, sort of background information that you should have. I'm not going to talk about here. And now we have uh, a short break, and then we will have two presentations, one from Australia by Professor Christopher Luke on embodied and information behavior, and then by David Escaramuzza. Okay, let's take a short break, and then we will start. We will switch to Tasmania and have uh, Christopher's guest lecture. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to the global virtual audience here in the uh, Shanghai lectures. I really have to say I like this very much, this interactive style to speak up. I think it makes the whole uh, lecture much more lively and much more interesting, and we get a feel of being globally connected in this uh, lecture hall. So thank you very much, and uh, see you next week. I don't know, Nathan, you want to say something? Okay, so see you all uh, next week. Thank you very much. Can you play the trailer? Yeah, play the trailer.